Welcome everyone, and thanks for being with us on this special Father's Day service. And if you're a visitor, a special welcome to you. And we'd love to hear from you. And if you'd like to learn more about Westwood and receive information, you can type the word connect and follow the number that's on the screen. We'd be glad to follow up with you. We're coming to you today from the Alexandria Golf Club in Alexandria, Minnesota, in the layman's room, because we are with our special guest today, professional golfer Tom Lehman. And this is, in fact, his uh, summer home, cabin place at least, and where he grew up as well. And it means so much to have you with us, partly because seven years ago, when I first had the idea of inviting influencers to be with us on Father's Day, you were the very first person mm -hmm. whom I wanted to invite. Wow. And I made the effort, and the reality is there's this thing that got in the way, the U.S. Open. Yeah. And I don't know what the big deal is with the I U.S. Open. Either. I mean, church or U.S. Yeah. Open? I mean, church is everything, but it was U.S. Open, and yet now you're here, and yeah. we get to be together. So thank you for being here. Thank and you. It means a great deal because I so wanted um, everyone to hear about your life. Mm. I think your Minnesota roots is really attractive. It stands out in terms of all that's happened to you in your life and your journey, your family, your faith story, your philanthropic way of living, and the major accomplishments that you've had. Far too many to account for, but at one point, if you're not aware, uh, Tom was uh, the ranked number one in the PGA for a season. What a terrific experience that was, no doubt for you. But then also, I think he had over 35 professional wins, including the big one, the British yeah. Open in 1996. Mm -hmm. And I, I, what stood out to me was this particular quality that you're the only golfer in all of golf history to receive three times um, the Player of the Year award for all three PGA tours. Right, yeah, is that the, correct? Yeah, the, the, the AAA League, which is now the Corn Ferry Tour, which for me was the Hogan Tour, became the web.com. You know, Player of the Year there, Player of the Year on the PGA Tour, Player of the Year on the Champions Tour. That, that's amazing. All these accomplishments, and we could go on and on, but I know just from hearing mm -hmm. from you in other settings that what stands out most to you and what you love most is the family that God gave to you. So let's start yeah, there. Sure. Just share a little bit about your family, maybe the influence of Alexandria mm -hmm. and uh, in your life and in your career. Yeah, well, thank you. It's great to be with you. Great to be with you. Um, yeah, we're here in my hometown. You know, this is this is where I grew up. We moved here when I was uh, going into fifth grade. So the summer after my fourth grade year, we moved here. Um, and uh, this club has been, a, you know, an integral part of my life uh, from the very beginning. I um, mean, of course, back then the, the trees were either non-existent or very small. Um, you could hit it about anywhere. Now it's a very tight golf course, so it's changed. Um, you know, but but even today, I mean, everywhere that I go, I. I see uh, these little things where I tell my kids, hey, when we were 15, this is what we did here. And when we were, when I was 17, you know, we were throwing tomatoes at cars and I hit a police car. And we, you know, and the, all the stories and all the things that happened throughout the course of uh, my, my early years, you know, which happened here, you know, every little, on every corner, you know, is something that reminds me. And so my kids get a big kick out of that. And my, my youngest son, who is now gonna be a senior, he's able to kind of live the life that I lived in the summertime and do what I did in the summertime and understand why I love it here so much. Yeah. And so you're married to Melissa? Yeah, I'm married. I have a great, great, amazing wife, Melissa. I met her yeah. uh, at the Bing Crosby tournament when I was uh, 23 or four years old, uh, blind date. Uh, we have four kids, uh, Rachel, who's 30, and Holly, who's 27, Thomas, who's 24, and then Sean, who's 17. Outstanding. Well, it's Father's Day, so obviously we have a call from the scriptures to honor your father and mother. Mm -hmm. And when you think of your dad yeah. and his influence in your life, even your career going to the University of Minnesota and then into the PGA, but so much more than that, what stands out to you concerning your dad's influence? Oh, the, well, you know, people talk about mentors and, you know, who... You know, who do you look up to? You know, my dad was my hero. We, we, we lost him 11 years ago. But he is the one who really inspired me and molded me as a kid uh, and as a young man uh, in so many different ways. I mean, he, number one, he was, in, he was a, um, a true uh, believer in the Lord. Uh, he went to church every single day. Um, I love that. You know, so he, yeah. he, uh, you know, he took his faith very seriously. Um, and his faith is what influenced you know, a lot of the way he lived his life. And so the way he lived his life and the choices he made, he then, he then passed down to all of us. Uh, I have two other brothers. Um, so whether it be 
respecting other people, respecting adults, the way you talk to adults, the way you approach school and give it your very best. I think maybe that was one of the, the big lessons is that whatever you do, you have to do your very best. You have to give it everything you have. I don't care if it's writing a paper for English, uh, shoveling the, the snow off the driveway. I mean, I don't know how many times it wasn't done quite right, we had to do it over again. You know, so the, the hard work, being dedicated, being committed, um, all the things that are so important as you go through any part of life, you know, my dad was the main influencer with that, you know, so. That principle is a biblical principle. What he well, was teaching you from Colossians, whatever you do in word or deed, do it all for the glory of the Lord, that he is your boss. And mm -hmm. ultimately, who thinks about giving half best or mediocre yeah. effort yeah. to the Lord. So he brought in that biblical value that clearly has had impact yeah. in your life as a whole. Do you have one favorite memory of your dad? Oh, a favorite memory. Um, I would know, don't know that there's one favorite memory specifically, but um, he never missed anything. I mean, he, he, I don't care if it was a practice or a tournament or a, a football game or a basketball game. I mean, he at some point during a practice day, he would show up just to watch for 15 minutes. Amazing. Never missed a game, uh, ever. Um, you know, so it was always, he was always there, always there and, and never missed. And, um, you know, he was quite an athlete himself. And I guess one memory I do have is uh, he was very fast. And so my senior year in high school, we were all the all the guys in our backfield at our house, we, we ran the option, so we'd always go out on the street and we'd run through the option just getting the timing down. And he would always tell us how, you know, I, I could beat you guys running backwards. And, uh, and so we finally said, okay, we'll take you up on that. And so we got our fastest guy, our tailback, and they had a race in the street. My dad ran backwards and he ran st straight ahead and my dad beat him. No kidding. <laughs> so oh. so uh, it's like he proved his point. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. When you think about your own life in terms of golf and faith, because there is a juxtaposition for you in your own personal journey, I think when people watch you play, you make it look so easy. But whenever I've heard you speak about your own story, you always talk about the struggles mm -hmm. that have been yours in the journey and even an awakening that happened in your own faith journey because mm -hmm. how, how did you come to faith yeah. in Christ and what was that awakening about for you? Well, yeah, the... Um when I was 15, so a sophomore in high school, right here at Jefferson High School, the, um, uh, the football coach was the, the FCA huddle leader here in Alexandria. And, and most of the really, you know, quote unquote cool guys, the guys that I looked up to, would go to this FCA meeting every Tuesday. Uh, and so I had, didn't really have any clue what it was. You know, all I knew was that the guys who mattered the most to me went, and, and, the, and the coach was the leader. So I went, you know, so. And it really wasn't even in the meeting. I couldn't even tell you what the coach said during the meeting. It was after the meeting where one of the guys was talking about this whole idea of that, you know, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. You know, so I realized at that moment that like, you know, I am somehow or another cut off from the God of the universe because of sin in my life. And, and that kind of was on the heels of laying in bed at night and looking at the ceiling thinking there has to be more to life than this. I mean, every day was the same for me. Get up, go to school, uh, go to practice, come home, have dinner, do homework, go play basketball at the gym, go to bed. You know, that was, that was my day every day. And it just like, okay, this, you know, where's the meaning in all of this? And, uh, and so for whatever the reason, and hearing that message at that FCA meeting, it helped me to understand that, that the lack of meaning was due to the fact that I really did not have any relationship with God at all. And uh, so that night I decided like, I don't wanna be on the wrong side of that coin. <laughs> you know, I wanna be on God's team, yeah. you know? And so I he said, hey God, I wanna be on your team. I wanna be on your side. I wanna be with you, not against you. And uh, without really knowing fully what I was doing, but, but knowing that I wanted to be over there and not over here, um, you know, there was a, an, an element of the weight of the world off my shoulders and, and an actual feeling of, hey, I do have a purpose, and the purpose was learned by me from reading the Bible. I started reading at Genesis 1, and I started going through it, and I'd read it over and over and over. As, and once I finished the Bible, I'd start over again. And uh, you know, so I found this purpose of, of, and a way to live and a, kind of a, a roadmap, a guidebook you know, through the scriptures. Out of that came your theme verse in life. Yeah, yeah, I got to Joshua 1.9. And, uh, you know, so I'm reading, you know, so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, like this is kind of boring stuff, and whatever the book Deuteronomy or something, all the laws and 
lineology, and then I get to Joshua, and it says, be bold and strong, banish fear and doubt, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I immediately grabbed that verse, like that's what I want in my life. I want the ability to be bold, to be strong, to live without fear and doubt, because God is with me. And, uh, and, I, and I have felt that, I had felt that, and I still feel that today. Yeah, you, I'm making a connection here, talking about your dad mm -hmm. who was present. You were a blessed man. Yeah. Your, your father on earth was with you, mm -hmm. which reinforces the image and the promise that God, your father, is with you. That's been part of your journey. But I think when we yield ourselves to the Lord, we're growing up in Christ throughout the chapters of our life. And mm -hmm. I've heard you speak about a reawakening yeah. of your faith when guilt was hovering yeah. over you. And what was that yeah. experience about? Right, so the, one of the big issues I dealt with as a kid was this whole idea of, of never quite measuring up. Okay, you're supposed to be perfect. You're supposed to be, be perfect as I'm perfect. I mean, I'd read that in the Bible, you know, be perfect as I am perfect. You know, how do you be perfect as I'm perfect? I can't be perfect, and therefore I feel guilty. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of times success, people have asked me a, a lot of times, many times, you know, what's easier to be on the bottom or on the top? And I've said, look, it's, it's way easier to follow the Lord when you're on the bottom, when there's, when there's nowhere lower to go. Yeah. But, you know, you, you want to test somebody's true character and their true commitment to, to the Lord, you know, give them a lot of success and see how that's dealt with. And I really believe with all my heart that success for everybody, whether you're a believer or not, is a difficult thing to deal with. Um, so much comes with that. And most of what comes with that is the sense of, entitlement saying, I've earned this, I've done this, it becomes I, 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 uh, versus you know, the Lord has given this to me. That's, that's the, the, the danger zone. As soon as you get away from God has blessed me with this or God has done this for me to I earn this, um, you start walking in a dangerous spot. So with that said, as my golf career got better and I became number one in the world and the leading money winner and the player of the year and making tons of money, um, it just seemed like my life got way unhappier. <laughs> you know, my life just, it just became more frustrating. And, and, uh, and I wouldn't ever say there was a time when I wasn't, you know, where I had walked away from God, not even close. Right, right. But just um, the nature of the game, the nature of the lifestyle, the nature of the fact that everywhere you go, you're being given the red carpet. I mean, they roll out the red carpet, you know, everywhere I turned. And so in the course of in being in prayer one day, uh, it was like this, this absolute voice says to me, it wasn't audible, but it was just, you know, God speaking to my spirit saying, look it, I came down to this earth to die for you on the cross, all right, to forgive you of your sins, to take away the guilt that you have, all right? You know, so why is it that if I can forgive you, you can't forgive yourself? If I can forgive you, Tom Lehman, you should be able to forgive yourself too. And I think that was, that was the message, is, is let go of this sense of having to be perfect. Because I think what happens is, the more you realize you're not perfect, and you don't know how to deal with that, the less perfect you become. You know, because of the, the guilt and the bad feelings, just, they just build up. You just embraced the fullness of your identity in Christ in a new way, and you got set free set in free. that. You know, Henry Nouwen, and we refer to this at Westwood a lot, just speaks so clearly around identity. I am not what I have. Mm -hmm. I am not what I do. I am not what people say about me. Mm -hmm. I am the beloved son or daughter of the living God. Right. And as we grow in love with the Lord out of how he has loved us, we are truly set free. Yeah. That's just an amazing story. Yeah. Another question about your faith, and I want to talk a little bit about golf. Yeah, yeah. And we have one thing in common. We both work Sundays. Yeah, yeah we do. <laughs> in completely different arenas, however. Yeah. And yet, I think about your journey where... My world is in the church world, and that's where I am. And I believe with all my heart that God gave the gift of Jesus Christ to birth the church, mm -hmm. that we're meant to be together in the church, but it may not be in the organized, dedicated place, each place, but two or three gathered together in the name of Christ. We're, we're part of that universal body of Jesus Christ. Right. And here you are traveling in your career, and settling into a church home becomes a real challenge but as you travel as a man of god how do you father well yeah wow well um again it goes back to what's been modeled you know i think a big part of a big part of what's been um, made life easier for me and successful for me 
in a family setting as what I was modeled to, be by, modeled to me by my parents. I think it's important for kids to see a couple things, that you're sincere about what you believe and that you're consistent about what you believe, but yet you're honest that you're not perfect. Yeah. You know, and so I think our kids have seen the fact that I'm not perfect. And I think it means a great deal to them when I go and I actually apologize to them if I've done something that's been offensive to them that I knew that I was wrong. Um, and, but I think they've understood very clearly um, you know, my belief in Jesus and what that means to me and the, the forgiveness he has for us and, and how there's repercussions for what you do, but there's also mercy yeah. and grace. And, and so, so the idea of, of forgiving them. So anyway, so it becomes a, a real positive um, passing of the, of the belief system to your kids. You know, if you, I think if you, um, I think that's why the guilt thing for me was such a powerful thing is it, it, it didn't, uh, it helped me to understand fully the idea of forgiveness and what that means so that my kids don't have to be burdened with that same thing. I like though that you elevate, your father was intentionally present for you. Very. And though you traveled and you had to be absent on a lot of different arenas, you found ways to get creative, to be intentionally present to your kids yeah. and to model to them the very core of your belief and love for the Lord yeah. and love for them. And the sacrifice, okay, I think the sac sacrifice, the sacrifice you make um, makes a difference. Like I remember one time, one of my daughters, uh, she, there's an issue at school, I was playing at Pebble Beach and uh, it was a serious issue and she was like in fifth grade or sixth grade. And, and so I um, got on a plane and I flew home to, to grab my wife and her and go have dinner and, and deal with the issue. And then after dinner, I got back and flew back and played the next day. Um, so to me, it's like, I'm not, it's, I only say that because it, it made her understand how important the issue was that I would do that. That's right. So, you made them the priority. And, uh, yeah. But she knew that what she did needed to be dealt with. It wasn't right. But she knew that she was a priority. She was worth it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and so I think those ways that you make that sacrifice for your kids, what are, what are you willing to do so that they get the point? Yeah. Um, and uh, so we don't always succeed, you know, but, uh, you know, but when you, do, when you do it right, it makes a difference. Yeah. So good. So good. Let's talk about golf a little bit. Yeah. What is for you the greatest thrill that you've had in your career journey? I think the most thrilling day ever was uh, the 1999 Ryder Cup at Brookline when the U.S. team came back uh, from four points down to beat the Europeans. That, uh, look at the fans are what make the Ryder Cup what it is. And you know, the, the way the fans in Boston were, uh, they, their, their enthusiasm, their patriotism, their nationalistic pride, whatever you want to call it, you know, it really kind of... Um, created a, a, an environment, you know, where this big comeback was just so electric. Yeah. Uh, something I'll never forget. When you were with us at Westwood for the men's breakfast, yeah, you really gave an extraordinary talk that way. I, I entitled it, I took notes of mm -hmm. that. Life lessons from Tom Lehman. There's so many good ones and obviously we can't go through all of them, but one of them that stood out to me is do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Do the right thing. You told the story about a cat. Yeah. Tell that story. Yeah. Well, it was a, a real momentous um, thing that happened. It was a very significant thing to me. I was uh, on what is now the Corn Ferry Tour with the Ben Hogan Tour back then, and I was an alternate member of the tour, and I'd only gotten in one tournament up to that point, and it was already July. So I wasn't playing regularly on that tour, but yet it was the, you know, the, the AAA system for the PGA Tour, so it was a significant tour. And, and I got into this tournament in Wichita, didn't have a caddy, went into the pro shop, asked if there's any caddies around. No, no caddies, but I'll find you one. And the pro found me, a, a guy who was a wrestler. He just graduated from high school. And so this kid caddied for me that week, and he didn't know anything about golf, zero. You know, when I say didn't know anything, I mean, I'm being really honest. <laughs> Knew nothing about the game. So he caddied for me that week at that tournament, and I won. Okay, I won the tournament. And, uh, you know, and it had a lot of, of significant... Um, repercussions. I mean, I was fully exempt the rest of the year on that tour. I'd be fully exempt the whole following year on that tour. You know, so in this tour, which was like the AAA of the PGA Tour, which gave access to the PGA Tour if you played well through that tour, you know, I was now a part of it full time. So it had a huge amount of, of kind of intermediate term meaning. Then on top of that, there was an immediate thing because I won 20,000 bucks and we were broke. We had zero money. You know, so the $20,000 check was a big deal. And, uh, 
it occurred to me that I need to pay my caddy. And typically when you win, you give your caddy a 10% commission on top of what you pay him for the week. You know, so you pay him for his daily work and then you give him a 10% bonus for winning. And so that's 2000 bucks. I thought to myself, well, what do I do with about this? You know, I mean, the guy is a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> he knows nothing. He knows nothing about the game, and he, he didn't help me with anything related to playing the game. Yeah. He was a nice kid. Yeah. Uh, he was my teammate, you know, but, but he, he, in terms of a caddy, he didn't do any of the typical caddy things. So I said to my wife, what should I do? Do I pay him the 2000 or do I just give him his daily you know, fee and call it a day? And she goes, well, I think you ought to do whatever you think is right. And I go, well, that's, thanks for your help. Um, so I thought about it, you know, and uh, this, this voice inside was saying, look, there's no written rule that your caddy has to be some really great professional caddy. He's part of your team. He's part of uh, the effort that week. He's a, the two of you out there together. He was your, he was your partner, your teammate. Uh, you, you, need, you need to give him that 2000 bucks. And so I wrote him a check for 2000 bucks. Uh, in addition to his daily fee, and, and uh, never really thought too much about it again, even though I knew. In the that, moment, you wrestled. Well, because we needed the money, you know, right. we needed because we had right. yeah, and, and this twenty thousand was going to get us a long way down the road with tour school, all all the things, and so that two thousand was a lot of money, a lot of money. And uh, but the minute I gave him the check, I felt good about it, but never really thought about it again, even though I know we needed it. But um, time goes by, and I finally got a letter from the kid about two or three months later, and the letter basically gave me his whole life story because um, he didn't really share it on the golf course. Mm -hmm. And his life story was simple of one of those bad things where dad left the family a long time ago, left mom to raise the kids, and she worked two or three jobs. The kids ran wild, drugs, alcohol, you know, dropping out of school in their family, and, and he ended up um, going way the wrong direction. And then the, the wrestling coach got a hold of him, and uh, he was also the FCA huddle leader. Oh. And, uh, you know, started to love on the kid, and, and the kid, you know, ended up getting into wrestling, uh, became a state champion wrestler, um, became a believer, you know, started attending FCA. And then he wanted, because of all that, he wanted to go to Bible college, at some Bible college not far away, but he didn't have any money, you know, and, and the tuition was $2,000. And wow. so that check that I gave him paid for the tuition to go to school at this Bible college. So it was really, uh, to me, it was this, this, this lightning bolt, you know, saying like, we got, very often we think that what happens to us is all about us, you know. Uh, and in this case, part of it was about you. You know, I blessed you, I took care of you, gave you what you need, but I gave you what you needed so that you could give him what he needed. Yes. You know, so the idea of, um, of uh, doing the right thing, knowing that what the right thing was and then following through became a blessing to this guy. And so often in our life when we don't, when we know the right thing to do, but we don't do it, and we, we're missing out on the blessing that God has for us in so many ways. Yeah, blessing for him and joy for you yeah. as well. Yeah. So good. I wanna ask you a question that's a sensitive one. You've been traveling the last few weeks, but yeah. you're a Minnesota native, and we have just been enwrapped around the yeah. reality of George Floyd's death and the unrest that followed. And wherever you've been when all of this was happening, what did it mean to you? How did you take it in? Well, you know, I was asked that same question last week in Fort Worth. Uh, having seen the video, um, there is, there is, I don't, I mean, you'd, you'd have to be a very calloused person to watch that video and not be um, just disgusted by it. Uh, to be moved by it. To, and I, th I think I read somewhere, I think Nikki Haley said it, everybody needs to feel this deeply and powerfully, the tragedy of it all, and understand uh, the message that you're hearing behind it. Um, so I think, you know, there's so many things, like, you know what, it's time to listen. Listen to people who are hurting. You know, uh, you don't have to always agree with everything they say, but it's really important to listen and hear what they're saying. You know, because um, when I would watch the video, I, I, I would, I fully understand that 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 this this disregard for the suffering of others or the pain of others, for the life of others, having that kind of disregard is maybe the core issue that our country faces. Um, and so I shared with the media in Fort Worth, and I'll say it again today. One of my verses I love so much is Micah uh, six eight. You know, and, and basically it says to do justly 
to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Um, and that's what's needed. I think the idea of doing justly, um, to love mercy, uh, to be humble before God, I mean, those are three things that we all need to learn. And so if you live a life that is disregarding the pain of somebody else, or disregarding the suffering that people may be going through, or, or disregard the life, somebody else's life. I mean, maybe you think they're below you. you know, but if that's the way you live, that's the way you think, then you are, a, you are the problem. Yeah. You are the problem, and, and, the, and we need to fix that. So it becomes more of a spiritual thing. It becomes more of a, uh, our issues really, I don't think, are, are flesh and blood and nuts and bolts. Our issues in this country are a spiritual issue about the, about the, the Creator who, who gave us all life, the Creator who created us all equally, the Creator who wants us all to treat each other justly and with mercy and to be humble about it. You know, that's the issue. You know, so, so, the, um, so I would just encourage everybody to look deep within. And if you, can, if you can walk by that person on the side of the road who's been beat up and just kind of go and keep going, then you're like those people in that story about the Good Samaritan who just who, who passed the guy who got beat up and, and, and didn't, didn't care. So if you don't care, um, I'm going to pray for you that you do care. Because, because if we start caring, you know, we can fix these problems. All right. You get to have the final word today. Yeah. So if you could say one last thing yeah. to men, to dads, to anyone who's tuning into um, this service today, what is it that you would say? We all need to get to that point where we fully understand what God has done for us and the grace and the mercy He has for us so we can live our life victoriously knowing that and also live our life with that kind of grace and mercy towards the people around us. And if we can do that, you know, we'll be a lot happier as a group. So good. It's really extraordinary, isn't it, that God uses us. He used you with the platform, but he uses all of us. We're his influencers. And I want to thank you for yeah. being our guest, carving out time at a season that is high demand for you. But because your life counts for one greater mm -hmm. than what this world offers, you made that time. You've blessed us with your presence. Really grateful for that. And I want to wish you a happy Father's Day. I wish our whole church family happy Father's Day. Make it a day of honor and a day of goodness. And I'd like to invite you to close in prayer with me. So Father God, we've come and we've been in your presence first and foremost and we're mindful of what you instructed us to honor our fathers and our mothers and we're grateful for that injunction, that imperative because it makes such a difference in the fabric of our lives and our society. So I pray, Father, that this day we would honor the dads of our lives well and Father, that we would remember the influence that they've had in our journey. So go to, before us to the end that we would do that in our own given family units. But also, Lord, I'm mindful that you take and you use us. I'm thankful for this gentleman, Tom Lehman, and I pray that uh, you would take his words and that you would honor him as he seeks to honor you and that you would prosper his family and his journey and all the days that are still ahead as you would for all the dads that are tuning in and families that are with us. But at the starting of this whole journey, we know that the, the best starting place is with you. So we remember you and we honor you as we remember your word that reminds us your mercies are new every day. Great is your faithfulness. So may we be faithful to you as you have been faithful to us in the power and the strength that's been given to us in Jesus' name. Amen.